Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. She was born into a life of crime and is now a suburban housewife. The author of Divorce from the Mob, My Journey from Organized Crime to Independent Woman. She is a sexy, street smart, with four children that was recently featured in the Netflix series, Get Gotti. Let's welcome into the show, Andrea Giovino. Andrea, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. How is everybody? We are great. I, my listeners, let me tell you something. You are in for a treat. Andrea has probably the best story that I have researched in all my years of doing this podcast. So let's just jump into it. Go your, ahead. Your father drove a truck in Manhattan. You were brought up in an Italian neighborhood in Brooklyn. Let's start right. there. Tell me about this Italian neighborhood in Brooklyn. Was it surrounded by mobsters? Did I mean, I was in an area, it was a poverty stricken area. So it was called Ozone Park um, in Brooklyn. And a lot of Italian immigrants came over. And my mom came from a family of like 10, uh, 16 children. So a lot of her brothers were mason layers. So uh, my dad was a regular hardworking truck driver. I'm one of 10 children. So uh, it, it's, you know, we, everybody in the area were Italian. So they, back then, they didn't believe in education like education is today, that it's a big deal. We didn't, none of us formally educated. And a lot of the kids in the neighborhood weren't educated. So there was a lot of crime in the neighborhood. A lot of, you know, uh, mobsters came out of that neighborhood of Brooklyn. A lot of, that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my mom, to make extra money, she was running card games in the basement of, of our home for Crazy Joe Gallo. And then at one point that all came about and she got arrested for that. My dad knows nothing of what's going on. He's just a normal, regular, hardworking guy. You know, my mother had this bit of a street smarts through her family. So um, I, I think that at a very young age, I was subjected to that and I've witnessed that. And I was very comfortable with those types of men because the biggest question I always get asked, um, were you afraid? And no. I'm not, I was never afraid because that was my norm. Right. You know, I look back now and like, was it crazy? Absolutely. I shouldn't <laughs> have subjected myself or my child because I was a young mom and mm -hmm. I was a teenager. I shouldn't have subjected myself or my child to that. But no, I wasn't afraid because it's like anything else. It's what you, how you raise your child and what they're subjected to. Their com it's their comfort zone. So that's basically it. Your mother taught you how to steal at the age of five by taking you to a Jewish deli to take milk and bagels. At the age of five, you don't know right from wrong. So you're just going by what mom says. When did you, yes. when did you realize that, okay, I'm committing a crime here or did you ever? Well, I don't, I don't think you know at that age that you're committing crime five, six, seven years old. You don't really know that you're committing a crime because you know that, you take the item and you're running and you're running home. So you kind of know it's something bad to do. You know, it's not something that you should be doing, but when you take your lead from your parents, they're your role models. So that's kind of how you go with it. And I think that from that age on, you know, we were all very street savvy kids mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah. What was your mom's outlook then towards the police? Oh, she had no respect for them. <laughs> no, no she, had, she had no respect for them. She was a tough, tough Italian woman, you know, very beautiful woman. They used to say she looked like Lana Turner. She's a very tough Italian woman, you know, had 10 kids, had a great little shape. And, uh, you know, everybody loved her. Everybody respected her. She stashed drugs and guns for cash. And you said earlier that, you know, Crazy Joe Gallo had card games in your basement. Were you aware of all but, this that was yeah, going but, on? But but she didn't she didn't do anything like that for Crazy Joe Gal. They just they just had um, basically card games in the basement of our home. But she wasn't really someone that was going to stash like she if people if kids in the neighborhoods would Donnelly hide the guns she'll hide the guns. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't into like doing drugs or anything like that. Gotcha. She had kids in the house. Did were you aware that? Or what was going on with crazy Joe Gallo in the basement? Were you part of that or no? No, I was so young. I, I just knew that the guys that when they would come, they were very polished and very dressed, very nice. Where my dad 
didn't wasn't like that because he was just a hardworking guy. You know, he wasn't like the suit and, you know, the pinky ring and the fedora and the long coat and the beautiful mm. car. We were poor. So, you know, you look at them and then you see he's coming home so hard worked and, you know, so it was just a whole different type of, you know, personality. Andrea, is it true then? Were you taken out of school at age 12? And if so, did you go back to school or no? I don't even know if I even was 11, 12. So that, that was not even middle school. So I really never did like a middle school junior prom or go to high school or let alone college. No, I've, I've had no formal education at all. And it was really weird because back then they had this doctor that they would um, sign us out of school. Like the doctor would sign a note and say that they can't go to school because they, they have a bad period. Wow. So your, yeah. your formal education ended at seventh grade and everything you've done on your own is street smarts and just l- learning the life of hard knocks. I have the education from the streets. Exactly. And I, I don't, if you research me, not only did I do get Gotti, that's the last big thing I've done, but I've been on the view with Barbara mm-hmm. Walters. I've been on 60 minutes. I've done numerous, numerous radio NPR, yeah. like all high level stuff through the years. And in like more of my story as we get into it is more of, you know, that's when I was younger in 1992, I was arrested, but like the life I have today is what my life, my story is more about redemption. And I think that's why, you know, they're very interested in making a documentary of my life story. I can definitely see that. Your brother is John Silvestri. He was a hit man and started stealing car radios around the age of 13 his, mm-hmm. his nickname was Johnny Bubblegum, and I love the nicknames of all the Italian guys had back in the day. They all had, they all have nicknames, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. They all have those names. At age seventeen, he committed his first murder. He told your mom, and did your mom say, "Did you make sure you put a bullet in the guy's neck?" And did she want to go check the body? Yes, yes. She was more like, you know, did you do the right thing? You had to do it the right way. And I remember arguing with her over that, like, are you crazy, you know, telling him this? But I guess, you know, I look back now, not saying that's right or, or at all, but when you come from that type of area and you come from like um, like streets and, and people are like back and forth killing each other. So it's kind of like kill or be killed. Mm-hmm. Like if you're putting yourself in that line of fire, it's kill or be killed. Like just what we're going through today in all the big cities, you know, like we have a big problem in Philadelphia with that. So um, I think that it was a way of life. I'm not going to say it was like something that you should like glamorize. It was something of a way of life. If you're in the streets and you're making money in the streets, you're going to come up against doing something like that. Was it encouraged then or was it frowned upon in your family to live this life? Um, I think that my mom loves street guys. Okay. She loved mob guys. So, you know, that's encouraged. Yeah. You know, she loves street guys. Uh, you know, they had money, they're charismatic, they dress nice, they spend. So yeah, she did. She did like that. I mean, she didn't say don't go out with them. She encouraged to go out with them. And to us, I'm going to be honest with you, Tommy, um, that it's weird because I look, it's so foreign to normal people about like what we're talking about murders say, but when you, when I look back then, that was like a conversation that is very normal. Mm -hmm. Like in, in that background, like, Oh, somebody's going to get, you know, put to sleep. Somebody's going to get whacked. We're going to, you know, that, that's that conversation back in that era was a very common like way of life. So it's not like it wasn't unheard of. There were many, many mm. kids growing up that were like that. Yeah, it, it was know? a different it was a different life period then. It was a different it was norm. a whole different life period. And it's it's like it was kind of expected. You have a problem in the streets, you better take care of it. And if you don't take care of it, they're gonna take care of you. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how it was. When did you then realize that this life wasn't the norm and the activities were illegal? Well, I got arrested in 1992 on a RICO. Okay. On a RICO charge with like, I think it was 22, 33 guys. I don't know. I had my lawyer on my podcast last night. She had pulled up all the old transcripts. Um, And 
what I think it was, that was my downfall because that's when I realized, you know, you know, 17 agents busted into my house. You're under arrest, conspiracy to distribute cocaine, marijuana, murders. Like, you know what a Rico is. You get yeah. charged with everybody else is getting charged. So they're all I'm right in with them. And so I think with that, um, woke me up to realize like, wait, what am I doing here? I'm going to lose custody. I did lose custody of one of my children. I was facing 10 years in prison. Um, you know, I was dragged out of my house, brought down, been arrested, facing, you know, not just facing my charges. Um, I, my husband at the time, my common law husband, I wasn't married to him, the father of my children, my two younger children, he was already incarcerated in uh, Tennessee doing an eight-year bid for marijuana. And uh, when I got out the next day, I said to him, John, you're going to have to do something here because uh, I can't go away for 10 years. I got little kids. My daughter was 15 months old and my oldest was 15. So how am I going away? I got a two and a half year old, a 10 year old. There's no way, you know, you, you're going to have to cooperate. You, I can't take the stress of all of this. I didn't, first of all, I said, I did not do, I didn't commit murders. All I did and got arrested for was I put my money out on the street with men backing me where I lent money to big drug dealers say, what happens, DEA arrests one of them. I don't, we don't know he's arrested. He's already cooperating with DEA and mm -hmm. DEA tells him, don't pay her the money because if you don't pay her the money, she's going to come for you. And that's exactly, it was a tactic. And I did on wiretap, I gave instructions to go to his house, go hurt him, get my money back. So I was arrested on that conspiracy. Gotcha. So with, with that, but on my case, there were murders involved. So still with that Rico, you get like thrown into that. So when I had asked him, I said, John, you know, I had nothing to do with murders. I had nothing to do with anything. I put money out on the street. I was a loan shock. The guy didn't pay back. And that's what, you know, you better help me out here. So he decided to cooperate along with my brother, because my brother was a three-time felon and he would have been doing life back then. Mm life without parole because the laws were different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that, and that's how that whole thing. So what happens when the indictments come down, if you know anything about that, the defendant, the, the, um, the attorneys for the other co-defendants, my name was lifted from the indictment. So now already red flags are going, she's off the indictment thinking she's cooperating, but I wasn't. Their names were still on the indictment, John Sylvester, John Fogarty. So now what happens is a contract put out on my life. People get arrested and go to prison for that. The feds go and come to me and say, I don't believe them. I says, I don't believe that. They brought the wiretaps to my attorney and let her listen. Mm. So by law, I had to be relocated because I had children under very young babies and they said, if you're not relocated, you could lose custody of your children because it's negligence. You're putting the kids in harm's way. So then I got relocated to where I'm at today, Pennsylvania. And it was at that time frame for me. So now here I'm, I'm facing prison time. The stress of that, raising kids by myself. They froze everything. They took everything when they came. They took my cause. They took my jewelry. I go to the bank the next day to go get money out to go to the store to go buy groceries, the, the, everything's frozen, frozen. I don't, I had not one dollar, not one dollar. They strip you completely naked, completely naked, you know, and it's a very humiliating, degrading, you know, trauma that happens to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's traumatizing. It's, it's definitely traumatizing. You know, when they busted in, it was September 9th, 1992, and they did this deliberately. It was the first day back to school for the kids, for everybody. All the mothers were outside. They shut the streets down. The newspaper was out there. They made a big doo-doo -do out of it. So it was extremely humiliating. I, I, you know, they gave me, they call it, they don't usually do this, but they said they gave me a courtesy call because kids were in the house. 
they did. They I, The phone rang six in the morning. This is DEA. Open the door. We're going to bust it in. So they gave me that courtesy where I ran down, opened the door. When I ran down, I had a T-shirt and panties on. And then I'm standing there half naked, you know, and I kept asking, can I get a robe? Can I get a robe? It's all men, one woman, one woman agent. I said, I really just want to cover myself. I want to get a robe. And they, they, they were like, well, you know, doing this deliberately. She ran up to my bedroom and got a robe and covered me. But it's an extremely humiliating experience. It's like not anything people should glamorize. And that's kind of what I always bring out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you because the movies have glamorized. Yes. The, the mafia and the mobsters yes. and the enforcers and the hitman. It, it's definitely been glamorized over the years. And it's as more movies think, get made, the so. more it gets glamorized. More, I think even more so now. Yeah. I was, I was saying the I more mean, movies I mean, like, get made. Look at all the movies that they make. You would think it's, it goes out of style. It doesn't people. There is such a big, big audience around the world because get Gotti was trending number one in 44 countries for like two weeks. What does that tell you? <laughs> it's exactly what we're saying. I mean, it's, it's, it is a craziness. You know, I have had several FBI agents and guys that have gone undercover against organized crime and they always appreciate me bringing them on. And I appreciate them coming on because I'm not trying to glamorize that life. What I'm trying to tell people is, is let get the, tell their stories that, Hey, this isn't a life that you want to get involved no. in. You don't want it's, to be in not, this it's life. Not a, it's not a life you want to get involved with. Like even not even an Italian culture, any culture of where the man is out in the streets doing illegal activity. You know, it can be black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever it is, Russian. And the, the woman is going to get caught up in that, mm -hmm. you know, the whole downfall is just not worth it. It's just not worth it because it's the consequence, you know, like with me, what happened to me, contract out on my life, facing 10 years in prison, lost custody of one of my children. You know, that's a lot of stuff to deal with. Yeah. That's a lot. And men can't deal with that. No. You know, and then, and then on top of that, all this I went through in my life, then I just start because I was told to start a podcast. So I start my own <laughs> podcast, Andrea Giovino. I get a podcast going and then I'm being called a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not a lie. I'm going to back up here, people. So you can kind of understand what she went through. You know, your husband, you mentioned him, John Fogarty. He was a tough Irishman who set up two Brazilian brothers, but he would bring home bodies. Can you tell me and my listeners the night he came home for dinner with a couple bodies in the trunk of his Lincoln Continental? Oh God. <laughs> well, that, that particular time he had this little red pickup truck and I had no, no idea. He, he was doing stuff like on the side for street guys. And, um, the, the truck I remember was in my name. So I was just like, like, why do you have blood on your shoes? Why do you have blood on your clothes? And then I had found out later on, there were two bodies in the back of the truck, <laughs> you know, and then he had a, warehouse a trucking he owned a trucking company so then he i guess they they had this spot on staten island where they would go dispose of these bodies and then when he cooperated they had to say the location and ev where everything was because you know if you when you cooperate with the government if you don't, you are not a hundred percent truthful all deals are off that's it mm -hmm. they will not use you because you'll blow their case so you have to be really honest. And um, it was just a, a very crazy, crazy life. But again, go back to that body. That didn't scare me. It's like, okay, wash the blood. You know, like it's crazy. You were basically immune to it. You're like a real life Carmela Soprano. Probably worse. <laughs> <laughs> Probably worse. Did it get personal? Andrea, I mean, did people close to you start getting whacked and disappearing? Well, one particular person that I did really like, he used to come to my house. Um, he was a um, Cuban guy that they used to deal with. My ex-husband, He they used to deal with him. Aldo, his name was. And he would come from Florida. I think that was their connection for the cocaine. And he would come from Florida when he come down. He would stay with me. 
and he had a wife and he had a daughter and I knew them because when I go to Florida, I meet them. And, um, he, he, he owed the money. He owed John money and he paid back money. It was counterfeit, $40,000 counterfeit. I'll never forget. And then they found out it was counterfeit and they said that he tried to set them up, but he said he didn't know that it was counterfeit because it was so good. So long story short, they killed him. So that really bothered me. I tried to warn him because what happened was that morning when he called me from John's warehouse, he had a trucking company and he called me from the warehouse. I'll never forget. It was like six o'clock in the morning. And um, he said, something's really weird, Andrew. And I was like, what's wrong? And he said, um, I was with John and then John just dropped me off here and he left me here. Like he just dropped him off at the warehouse and left, took the truck and left. I says, oh, Aldo, get out of there. Get out of there. I said, I don't like the way that sounds. I said, get out of there. Something's going to happen. Long story short, then the two other guys went there and then they killed him. We're, we're trying to say, people, I mean, it's not a life you want to be involved in. People, you know, it gets personal. You, you know, you're, you're covering up murders. You got all kinds of stuff happening. And it's, it's, it's extremely stressful, yeah. dangerous. Were you guys always on the lookout then for the FBI or are you looking over your backs for someone to whack you or your husband? You're always, you're all, you're, you're always the best way I could explain it. Um, you're always like this, <gasps> you know, like the door, somebody knocks on the door. Who is it? You know, like it's, it's always like a stress, <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> you know, e either you're facing a hundred years in prison or you're going to get a bullet. That, that, that's basically what you're up against. Fighting, you're fighting all these cases. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Were you then always like fighting multiple cases at one time or always, you know, trying to cut, get one done and another one would come up? No, I, I just had that one case. Just I didn't have any other cases. No, I basically, for me, I was just somebody that put money out on the streets because my husband was incarcerated and I knew how to maneuver myself. And then I got lured into, you know, doing all that. And especially being a street person, I had been around a lot of street guys my whole life. I was living with somebody at 22 years old that was a captain of the Colombo family. So I had like a lot of street smarts from being with all these people. And, um, you know, I knew how to make an illegal living, you know? Mm -hmm. So basically even with my street smarts, when I was relocated to a very rural area in Pennsylvania, I used my street smarts to survive. And people ask me, what did you do? So I always knew how to cook, clean and cater to the man. I did utilize that. I started nannying for very wealthy families. And then I started with that cooking and, you know, I utilized what I knew growing up. How did you meet Mark Ryder, John Gotti's right-hand man? How'd you meet him? Yeah, John, Mark, he was very close to John Gotti. I met him. I was at a club in Manhattan, a club that everyone would frequent call Club A. They, all these guys would go there like a really upper scale club. Um, and that's how I met uh, John Gotti through Mark Ryder. So, and I actually just right before I did this, I talked to him. He's still in federal prison. I talked to Mark Ryder, you know, um, a lot of guys are getting out of prison now because the laws changed. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is, is getting those types of guys onto my podcast that never have cooperated. And, and that's what you don't have. Yeah. Right. Because you have all these you know, so I just did one last night. It'll come out in a couple of weeks. I did George Moderano, 32 years. The guy I did last night, 15 years. These guys never would talk, but now they want to tell their story because they never did cooperate. And it's just something that is good because you try to understand, like I try not to judge until you are in that person's shoes of back then they were giving life sentences, life. They were given life without parole. People cooperated because nobody wants to do life. And let me say, in the streets, there is no loyalty. They'll turn on you like that. Mm -hmm. So really, you, you need to be loyal to your family. Right. And to do the right thing there. So it's a doggy dog world. The Code of Omerta is, is as strong as it can hold weight on paper because they're going to flip. As, as soon as they get caught, they're going to flip. The only people you said it perfectly. They're gonna the flip. Yep. The only people you have loyalty to is your blood and your family. Is your blood and your family, your children. I had loyalty to my children. You know, unfortunately, I wasn't going to cooperate because 
I didn't, I wasn't involved in what they did. So I wasn't going to, they didn't want me. Mm -hmm. They actually said, we want them. We, they used me and arrested me as a tactic. Sure. So knowing that they weren't going to make me go do 10 years and his kid is going to be in child services. So that was a tactic, but, um, there are so many movies that are made on this topic and it never seems to go out of style. No. You know, I, as, as Gotti, get Gotti was trending. I was trending. I didn't even know what trending meant. I'm like, I'm trending. <laughs> My name is. <laughs> so yeah, because everybody's like, who is she? Who is she? <laughs> Speaking of Gotti, then after you meet him, how do you become his, his trusted advisor? No, I wasn't his trusted advisor. They put that. I mean, let's get that clear. Let's let's clear that up where um, the producers and the directors put associate. I was not associate. I was just a friend of John Guy. Okay, I sat with him, went out with him. You know, we frequented because I was with Mark Ryder. And of course, you're going to meet the people that he's with. So I like John Gotti. He was a gentleman. Um, But no, I wasn't his trusted advisor or his associate. So that wasn't me. That was the production company. Gotcha. Andrew, what was it about the, the 1980s that made it so easy to get away with basically anything? God, the 1980s. I mean, come on, the disco, the, <laughs> the, 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 the glam of the clothes, everybody dressed up. Right. It was just amazing. The 80s were amazing. The music. Yes. I mean, it was, it was just really amazing. I think that people got away with a lot of things because it wasn't like today, the, um, the technology, the education that has advanced with these law enforcement agencies that have grown to understand how criminals think, how to infiltrate them. So a lot has happened since the eighties. And, you know, then you come up with, you know, the RICO law, which put a lot of them, a lot of them in, in uh, jail for a long, long time. And, I think that they got away with a lot because there was, they didn't have the technology like they have today. Was your house bugged? No, my phones were. That's how I was arrested. The phones were, the phones were bugged. Tell me about this beach house you had on Staten Island. Understand everything from the wallpaper to the rose bushes was. Well, it was, it was, it was right. It was by the beach. It was, it was a beautiful house. So yeah, the, the wallpaper was Oscar de la Rente. And um, we decorated it beautifully. I had a live-in maid. Here's one thing I would like to tell to the viewer. I had a live-in maid. She was a Brazilian woman. Her name was Graza. From having a live-in maid, when I was arrested and my life changed, I became a maid to other people. That's how it humbled me. I had to put food on the table. So I had to go out and clean houses. You know, Mm -hmm. the wheels turned. Completely full circle. Exactly. It's a humbling, it's a humbling circle. So yeah, the house was, um, we put a lot of money into the house and for Staten Island, it wasn't a mansion, but it was a a nice area and it was a beautiful home. Were you one of the typical, I know nothing, say nothing, see nothing mafia wives? Oh, well, I would never speak to anybody. We, we, we stay in a very close knitted circle. You don't really bother with the neighbors or anything like that. You know, you just stay amongst yourself because you don't want to be asked any questions. And coming from an area like that, people know not to ask questions. Mm. You know, they know not to ask questions. I think like someone asked me recently, um, well, when you were arrested, what did all the neighbors think? I said, I'm sure the neighbors actually knew what was going on because we had Lincolns in the driveway (laughs) and BMWs in the driveway. (laughs) Nobody went to work. So they must have knew. I mean, you know, this is like where all these people live. So people probably knew. You said a few times that, you know, things didn't scare you. You didn't think anything about it, but did you get scared when you heard the the FBI wiretaps that there was a contract out on your life? You know, I, that question, it's amazing. I still, I think that I've always had a very strong sense of my faith. Like I'm a practicing Catholic. So I always, no matter what, would go to church. I always was, um, even with all that going on, it was always a part of my community with the church. And I think that I always had a very strong sense of my faith that I would say I was more angry that 
they said there was a contract animal left, then scared because I feel that the guy upstairs is going to tell me when I'm going to go. And that's going to be my destiny. I'm not going to put like have these people take that much of me where I'm going to be afraid of anything or anyone. I'm just not that kind of person to be afraid. I'm not. So the answer to your question, no, I wasn't afraid. I got angry. And that's when I decided to write the book and come forward and tell my story and tell it the way it should be told. And that's why I also decided to do a podcast because there was a lot of lies that are put out there that aren't accurate. And all you need to do is call me up and I'll give you an interview, (laughs) but don't put lies out there. So, you know, like, but I think people just come up with their own stuff and they say things and I'll correct you if it's wrong, you know, like, no, I didn't live in a mansion. It was a very nice area. It was a very nice home, but, um, you know, I wasn't John Gotti's closest, you know, I was a friend of John Gotti's. Did he know me? Absolutely. Did he give me the name Rocky? Yes, because he said she's got more balls than some of the guys that are around me. (laughs) So that's what his quote was about me. But, you know, people want to run with, you know, the negativity. And that's what I'm learning about this whole YouTube stuff. Yep. Listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put a link to the book, Divorce from the Mob, My Journey from Organized Crime to Independent Woman. And then my, put a link to my podcast too, if you can, like it's yep. Andrea Giovino one. I, you'll see it's, you, are you on Instagram? Yes. Yes, I am. I'll put a link to the podcast you, and the book. Do you follow me on Instagram? I believe I do. I believe I do. Okay. Cause I have to, I have to follow you back. Cause I never knew who people are. Yeah. yeah. So then just tag me on Instagram and all that. Sounds good. Your brother, he's been put in witness protection program. Do you have any contact with him anymore? Do you know I, where he's I at? Don't, no, my brother and I do not talk, so I really know nothing about him. We have no relationship. Looking back then, Andrea, are you shocked that you made it out? Um, you know, back then, that's a good question, because back then, if you remember where you do the history, do your homework on that, they were killing whoever, women. It yeah. They were putting bombs the car like it was a very it was like the wild west so i'm i'm thank you jesus i'm blessed to be here and i'm here for a reason and i tell my story i mean mostly my podcast is is gonna i have to ride the wave right now because it's the crime stuff but i want my podcast to be more of positive stuff for women and redemption and helping women to get out of that life of whatever it is and help them to understand to see red flags and and danger zones so they don't have to go through a path of what I've been through. Yeah. I've said before that era and that time period was a very volatile time period. I mean, blow up, very, car- very blow up cars, blow up people. It didn't matter. Anything. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Like, you know, like they come and that, you know, it was very, very scary. I mean, look at, you know, the, the stories that you hear of other criminals, you know, high profile criminals, like even with the get Gotti show when, um, I thought that was made very well because they had all of the actual people that brought down Gotti. And the thing that fascinated me the most when I watched it was when the agent said to him, well, think about what you said in the apartment. And then all when that came out and he was arrested and all those tapes play of all the crimes you talk about and all the murders. For the normal Joe that's sitting there as a juror, the normal woman that's sitting there, that's insane. You know, we come from that lifestyle. We're used to that kind of talk. Normal people aren't used to that. Right. So, you know, like that, that like woke me up like, wow. Do you miss any part of that life? Oh God, I hate that life. I hate the talk of that life. I hate it. I, I just would never go near a man like that today. I, I, it desp- I despise it. It disgusts me. No, absolutely not. There's nothing good about it. How long did it take you, I guess, let me rephrase the question, to transition from that mob life to a new norm life? <sighs> Years of hard work. Mm. I mean, I'm talking therapy. I'm talking with my priest every Tuesday for the first two years because I didn't have any friends because I didn't want to talk to anyone because I didn't trust anyone. You know, um, it took me a long time to develop and change into the person I am today. You know, I'm still a very strong person, you know, in many ways of 
like not falling apart, not falling down. You know, I have a very strong will. But I think today I'm more about um, giving back, helping, being kind, just being kind, being a good person, being kind and trying to understand that I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've subjected myself to sociopaths like narcissistic sociopath killers, you know, and it's just, you know, I lay in bed sometimes at night and I think like, what was I thinking? You know, what, what, what is, what did attracted me to this? So I've been single for a very long time now. It's been eight, eight years, but probably legally separated for 10. I'm divorced eight. And um, I have no desire to really date or anything because I just feel I've had such a rough road with men and um, I, I don't trust. I have no trust. You know, these men, not only, you know, we talk about, we're talking about murders, but these men, they're not loyal. You know, you have men that go out and commit murders. You think by them going cheating on their wife or their partner, they don't weigh that as nothing. That's like a sport to them. Mm-hmm. There's no morals. No. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just not good. And then what that does also, it lowers the woman's self-esteem very low because, you know, you're, they're putting everybody else before you. You're the last person on the totem pole. So it's, is it a good life? No, I would never miss that life. That's why I really do want to help a lot of other people to understand that, you know, it's not anything to be glamorized or talk about, or, you know, think that, you know, you know, like I, I see because I haven't been in this YouTube world. This is very new to me since the get Gotti, And just by me seeing how, Many of the fans love the men that have these channels that were street guys. They like look up to them and idolize them. And it's actually sickening and sad to me because that's not who your hero, you know, why why don't you go make the hero, the guy, the fireman that runs into a fire to save the family, you know, or the surgeon that just saved the child, you know, or the priest that gives a sermon every every Sunday and, and helps people to do the right thing and be kind. So I've learned, I've developed, and um, I think that, you know, it, it's just as much as I can say. It's, it's they're mean-spirited, and as much as people say they have changed and they're, you know, found God or whatever, you have to walk that path. Mm-hmm. And, and to walk that path... No matter how many times people, you have to be kind. You don't come out and be rude or, or angry or, you know, you, you, oh, there's always a better way to handle situations. I have said this for a long time. The mafia is as popular now as it ever has been. I think a whole new generation of people that have grown more up, so. yes, are so infatuated by that that was real. That is real things that happened back in those days. They just they can't wrap their brains around it. And they can't get enough of it. And I think like what um, Netflix wanted, like the company I work with, Raw TV, that did it, the production company. They wanted a woman's point of view to, you know, bring in a woman's point of view because let's face it, fifty percent of the world are women. And like they say, no, John Gotti. These men love being around beautiful women. John Gotti loves sitting with beautiful women. You know, other people will disagree with me, but I'm telling you fact. There's no reason for me to lie to you. They love that. Mm -hmm. You know, these men love beautiful women. That's why I'm so excited about having the guys that are coming out of prison and I'm getting them through Mark Ryder, having them call me to tell it firsthand. The people you're hearing, you're hearing it firsthand from people that have done years and years and years in prison and people that know me very well and know of me back in the day. Do you still have a relationship with your ex-husband? No, mm -mm, I don't have a good relationship. I don't really talk to him at all. No, I think what happened with that when he went to prison, he still went to prison, even though he cooperated, he still did prison time. I think he did like eight or nine years. And then when he came out, I gave him an opportunity to get back with his family and he fucked up again. So, you know, that was just like, there was no change to me. There was no growth there. You know, he was an always was an addict. You know, you're an addict. You have to work on yourself. He always had an addiction to cocaine. So when he came out, he just switched his addiction to alcohol. So now he's 
you know, alcohol, then going out after work, going to the bar. And I was just like, I'm too old for this. My kids are grown. I'm not dealing with this. Yeah. I'm not dealing with this at this point in my life. You know, the lies, the sneaking, the deception. I'm, I'm too old for this. Yep. Speaking of your children, you said you had lost custody of one, but how did you keep them safe through everything? I lost custody of one. Um, well, he's back with me. Once he turned 18, he came back to me. He's, you know, we have a great relationship. He's 42 now. So um, how did I always put my children before me? I, you know, I put my children first. I kept them close to me, close, you know, I'd take my eyes off them. And I, I was uh, relocated by DEA and FBI funded, not the marshals. They took the money from their funds to relocate me to a safe area where a beautiful rural area where the schools are great and everything is, you know, um, good. And, you know, and, and they helped me to get settled into a community where I was safe. And right, I didn't know this until maybe after I was living there about six months. They put me in an area like directly across the street where I lived was a police sergeant that he knew who I was and was always watching out for me. Mm. So I was in a pretty safe area, um, a community that was, you know, a small community. And I'm in, and I have a beautiful home today. I live alone. I have a beautiful country home. The kids all come to me in the summer because Grammy has the built in pool. <laughs> and, you know, I made it. I made a nice life for myself. Um, and I like my life. I like living alone. I like, like, I never realized, like, it helped me to develop who I am and really like me, you know, opposed to, I always felt like I needed to be in a relationship. And I think that until you find yourself, you can't really be in a relationship with anybody if you don't really love yourself and know who you are. Right. So. I think that um, I'm in a good place today. Are your children good? Do they have any like trauma from all that? Are they all good? Um, well, they, my kids, I've had them in therapy and stuff. Like that. We're a very close knit family in church. So we talk to a priest. We're that, you know, my daughter has, two, well, I'm a grandmom of two babies. She's pregnant again. The babies were baptized. We go to church together. My my sons will go to church. We'll all go to church together on Sunday, Sunday mass, take mom to church. And these are tough guys. You know, they, they, they were raised by me. They're not like, you know, they're, they're, they're good kids and all, but they're a little rough around the edges, but they're all good kids. They're all hardworking kids. They're all successful. And I think I did a great job with all of them. And they're very, very close to me. They're all very close to me. My boys don't make me want for nothing. If I didn't have, they give. I mean, they're just wonderful to me. I want to end on this question. If somebody would have came to you back in 1992 and said, in 2023, you're going to be living on your own, doing well with your own podcast, your children are going to be good. Would you have bought it? No. 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 Because I was so... If somebody would have said to me, you're going to be moving, I would say, no, I'm never leaving this area. Like, no, because especially for me, change is hard. It's the hardest thing to do. I'm afraid of change. I was always afraid of change, but change is growth. Change is hard. It's growth. It's painful. Mm -hmm. It's very painful, but it's growth. You grow in another area. And I believe this is the person I was supposed to be. Well, I know one thing. You'll continue to grow. You'll continue to spread a good word. You'll continue to do good things. I'm sure of that. Of course I will. And if I can help someone, I'm the first one to go out and help them. You know, I've taken women into my home. I've taken dancers into my home and let them live with me and try to explain to them, do not do this for a living because what you're doing, you're degrading yourself for men throwing money at you. Don't do that. I've right. taken them into my home and helped them to develop. I've helped young women. And I don't usually say this. I haven't said this. I've had women that are teenage moms and help raise their children so she could go to school and get an education. She would drop the baby off to me from uh, seven in the morning to six at night. And I would watch that baby just so she can get an education because I know how hard it was for me without an education. So I, I give back a lot. I give back a lot. The man upstairs has done great things with you. Absolutely. And I'm here for a reason. And you know what? No matter how many darts these men in this genre throw at me, <laughs> I'm still here and I'm going to stay here. That's right. Andrea, thank you so much for coming on the show and telling your story a little bit. People, get to the links, get the book, and check out her podcast. Go subscribe to the podcast for me. Do that. Please subscribe to the podcast. Yes. Please. I'm going to subscribe. And, and
And when I come out to um, Vegas, I think I'm supposed to come out in the spring. Maybe we'll get together. Would love to. Would love to sit down and have lunch with you and talk with you. Definitely. Definitely. Listeners, do me a favor. Join the exclusive Before the Lights members group. Click the link in the show notes. It includes a private Zoom calls with former guests, a -a one-of-a-kind poker chip, extra content, and more. It's only $7.99 a month, and it's your way to support the show. That's going to do it for this episode of Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale, and until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin-chin. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy.